Welcome to Heavens Declare. I'm Jim Burr, sharing the heavens, the universe. Uh, previous two programs, we were talking about science in the classroom and showing how they say, we want testable science. We want something we can test, something we can falsify. We don't want intelligence. We don't want creation. That's faith. And actually, it turns out that it takes an awful lot of faith, more faith than I have, to believe in the Big Bang Theory, to believe in evolution, uh, that we can come from little microorganisms to man uh, could, be, could evolve through mutations. Their, their only hope is this copying process of the DNA, that it makes mistakes, and some of these mistakes once in a while gets a beneficial mistake, and then natural selection, survival of the fittest stays over, and here we are after billions of years. I, <clears throat> have done quite a bit of homeschool seminars, and I often bring in a, a frog and uh, ask some of the girls to volunteer to come up and kiss the frog, see if we can turn him into a prince. And uh, if you turn him into a prince, of course, uh, that uh, uh, becomes a fairy tale unless you add millions and millions and millions of years. You say they used to believe in spontaneous generation of life, and Louis Pasteur demolished spontaneous generation of life. Back then, uh, the recipe, you got a recipe for making mice. You simply put grain and rags in a corner, and in a few weeks you had baby mice. Uh, spontaneous generation. So that has been uh, demolished, actually. But uh, I want to pick up a little bit from that program. We're going to get into the Little Bang Theory, which is a totally new concept, I think, for many people. Uh, but I want to finish a little bit from the previous program because uh, when we look around the universe, we see all these constants uh, that, you know, the, the Bible says, the Lord says, I am uh, the Lord, I change not. And we see hundreds of constants, they would call them constants, things that are, are constant that the universe depends on to, to survive. And uh, I have a special issue of... Uh, uh, from Scientific America on uh, cosmology and the origin of the universe. And in there, they talk about the problems, you know, how, how could everything come from nothing? Uh, as, uh, you know, the, the, the very existence of the Big Bang, how could everything appear from nothing? When they look around the universe, the uniformity is a problem. It doesn't seem to match an exploding star. Uh, the expansion of the universe, the fact that we see the universe expanding, that's a problem. Dark matter is something they create to see, uh, to explain what's happening in the galaxies. Uh, vacuum energy is maybe what's sucking these galaxies apart faster and faster. Why does everything go round and round? If, if, and we're going to get into the Hedron Collider, and you'll see when we have, uh, they smash these protons together. What happens? They go off in lines, straight old lines out. They, and, and yet we see all the galaxies spinning. We see all the solar systems, that, you know, all the planets spinning around our sun. Why does everything go round and round? It does not seem to match up with a big bang, a big bang explosion. Uh, density is a big problem, the density of the universe. It must be in one in part in, one part in 10 quintillion, which is uh, very critical. Uh, the vacuum energy density. Uh, here was an article uh, in Sky and Telescope magazine, page 22, Ju June 2010, talking about the vacuum energy density of the universe. It says, theoretical attempts to calculate the expected value of the vacuum energy density produces results that are at least 50 orders of magnitude higher than what they observe. That's like 50 zeros. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, the Bible tells us 17 times God stretches out the heavens. That's what we seem to see uh, happening in the universe. It seems to be expanding, and uh, the Lord didn't need dark matter or vacuum energy. Um, and so our um, class today, our subject is conservation of angular momentum. If the sun formed from rotating cloud, then everything should be rotating in the same way. If the Big Bang happened, then nothing should be rotating. And so we look at the Hedron Collider. Some of the constants in the universe. <clears throat> uh, many features in the law of nature appear to be so finely tuned, a small change in any one of the constants that appear in physics, uh, physical equations typically lead to a disaster. That was from Scientific America, January 2010. Some of the uh, 
uh, constants that we have would be the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. We, we actually know more about the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force than we do about the gravitational force. They're testing the gravitational force uh, due to gravi you know, gravitons, gravity waves, travel at the speed of light. Uh, one of the constants is the mass of the proton, the density of the universe, the electromagnetic force constant, the ratio, uh, ratio of the electromagnetic force constant with the gravitational force constant, <laughs> and the ratio of the electron to the proton. And God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Some more of these constants would be the ratio of the electron to the proton mass, the ratio of the number of protons to the number of electrons, the mass density of the universe, the density of the galaxy clusters, the cosmological constant, the mass of the neutrino, the fine structure constant, the decay rate of the proton. And those are some of the constants they tell us that they shift even just slightly. There's no life on Earth. And so, uh, you know, getting back to mutations and, and how, where did we come from? They cannot tell you how life started. They cannot tell you. The best example they have is Miller and Urey uh, with their, uh, you know, their, their ammonia and their hydrogen and their, uh, uh, their methane boiling in this little container that uh, evaporated and condensed and they had uh, 400 below zero and what they made was tar, stuff we make roads out of, and it had left-handed and right-handed amino acids and uh, all of life is made the eukaryotic cell is made by left-handed uh, amino acids. Even one right-handed would destroy what they're trying to do, create life. And that is in the textbooks. This is the best example we have of how life could have started in a warm little pond, and then evolution takes over once you get a microbe who makes mistakes in his copying of his gene pool and the mutations. Uh, oh. Occasionally, some would be beneficial, and here we are. Everything came from this warm little pond. To go from a microbe to man, you must invent about three billion nucleotides. That's letters. Please tell me how stupid atoms can write their own software. <laughs> the DNA is, uh, uh, Bill Gates said, the DNA is more complex than any computer code ever devised. Now he goes even further, he didn't say more, he said it is very, very much more complex than any computer code ever devised. How many you know, software people has Bill Gates hired over the last, you know, how many, 30 years? <clears throat> he says DNA is more complex. And even Francis Crick, who discovered it, he knows he knows that life could never have evolved when he sees the complexity of the DNA. And so Francis Crick says, it must have been aliens that brought life here. Sent it maybe on a comet or, uh, you know, uh, well, where did they come from? Well, it was, an, it was uh, you know, another advanced civilization of aliens that started life. And where did they come from? Another advanced civilization of alien life. And folks, they, they just can't admit that, that, that there's a God that created it. Um, it's absolutely impossible to have upward mutations. In your genetic code, you have six billion letters in that code that makes you, the recipe for you, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a message of God written in the universe, a picture of you that has never been seen before. That's six billion letter codes. Evolution says mistakes in copying is how we came from that warm little pond. But folks, there are 50, if you get our series, you'll find there are 50 genes that are designed to fix the errors, that proofreading that corrects for errors. And even though you may make up to a million mistakes, every cell, what, every time it's copied, your letter code, your genetic code, every time it's copied, you can have 100,000 to a million mistakes. When the proofreaders get done, you only get one in a billion mistakes that get through. And that's why you could not evolve from this pond, because every time you try to get a mutation, 50 genes say, no, you don't. <laughs> okay, so I, I wanted to move along because we've been talking about uh, science in the classroom, testing the Bible, testing evolution. And uh, there's one graphic I wanted to share with you, and that has to do with a fossil fish. In fact, I have the, uh, uh, I have the, the fossil here, and... Uh, 
you'll see a fish that's as flat as a sheet of paper. And uh, how do you get a how do you get a, a flat fish? How do you get a piece of fish? How, you know, you throw a fish on the beach. What happens? Well, the birds eat it. You end up with just bones in a, in a day or two. You cannot create a fossil. Fossils are not being created today. But if you have a flood, like the Bible says, it was a flood, and, and all of a sudden we have layer after layer after layer of fossils in here. If you were to look at the edge of this, you would say, I can see a fish there and a creature there and a creature there and a creature there as flat as a sheet of paper. If the fountains of the deep open up and they bury all these creatures, that's how you get fossil fish, a whole fish flattened out to find as a piece of tissue paper. So the Bible says if we want to test Evolution test the Bible. We can test the Bible. It says that there was a global flood, and we can test that. Um, and some people say, well, there was not enough water on Earth to have a flood. Okay. <laughs> and yet scientists say that Mars was flooded. How much water is on Mars today? Well, they think they may be a little bit under the soil they found there, having a really hard time finding water on Mars. But science says Mars was flooded but it doesn't have any oceans today, and on Earth we're 70% ocean. They say there wasn't enough water to flood the Earth. Uh, there is much evidence for a global flood, including evidence from geology, archaeology, ancient legends, and catastrophism. Dr. Aaron uh, Smith of the University of Greensboro collected a complete history of the literature on Noah's Ark. He found 80,000 works in 72 languages about a flood. So that's one area we can test. We can see evidence that there was a flood. Uh, we've talked about the fact that the animals reproduce after their kind. Evolution says, no, we have cross-species evolution. Ten million species all came from a little microorganism. The Bible says after their kind, they reproduce. The Bible says it was a global flood. The Bible says you can't count the stars. We have proven that. The stars are innumerable. And that was 3,000 years ago. Scientists today agree with that. The Bible says 17 times he stretched out the heavens, and science agrees with that. Uh, the Bible says the earth hangs on nothing. We can test that. The Bible says the earth is a circle and it's not flat. We can test that, and we have tested that. The Bible says the earth is getting old like a garment. And uh, the Bible says it was a flood. Okay, we've seen all that. The Bible says one star differs from another star. All of these things, if you want something you can test, we can test, and what we've shown in these two programs is the fact that <laughs> science is constantly changing. We're making new discoveries, books are becoming obsolete, and you could actually, if you want something you could test, you can actually test that. Uh, I want to go to the graphic that we have of the back side of the moon. Uh, we, the front side of the moon is quite smooth. The back side of the moon is just beat up like crazy. How does a creation, you believe in creation and God, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? Evolution says, well, of course, uh, you know, it's been here for billions of years. That's what we expect. So how do we as creationists, folks, there is a really good explanation for that. The next graphic, you will see the front side of the moon. The sign that we see uh, actually is quite smooth compared to the uh, one we just saw. You see how smooth that is. And so the back side of the moon has gotten really beat up. The explanation for that is uh, something has happened since the flood. At Creation, every day, every day was good. Every day was good. Every day was very, very good. An asteroid hitting the Earth is not good. A man already in 2016 was killed in India with an asteroid hit. We remember, you probably remember seeing the one from uh, Russia in uh, February, I think it was about 2014. We had this tremendous asteroid that came in and it like blew out windows and destroyed some buildings and people died and uh, made a great big hole in the, uh, in the ice, you know. Um, and that would not be good. Yet every day of creation was very good, was very good. What happened? What has happened since creation? Um, something has happened. Well, we have another graphic coming up and uh, it shows that we are living in a, our earth is going through a shooting gallery. Uh, here you see the Sun in the center, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and you see the asteroids that are crossing uh, our orbit and the orbit of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. I would suggest that this was not true in creation. This was not there in creation. Every day was very good. An asteroid hitting it was not good. We get hit every month. We get every two weeks. Our Earth gets hit 
with an asteroid, the impact of which would be like a hundred thousand, like a thousand tons of TNT. Every two weeks we get hit, our Earth gets hit. I have the pictures from NASA looking for uh, testing, uh, nuclear testing. And every two weeks we get hit our planet. Now the planet is 70% ocean and another 30, 50, 40% of it is, uh, I mean, I, well, very high percentage would be desolate land and deserts and, and, and forests and so forth where man is not uh, inhabiting. So uh, many of these impacts we don't see. And they, and they burn up. You see they come in at the Earth. Uh, Earth is traveling 66,000 miles an hour. And these impacts burn up. But on the moon, there's no place, they don't burn up. There's no atmosphere to slow them down or burn them up. Um, and so they're uh, impacted. Uh, there is evidence now, I've known about this for 30 years. A, a gentleman wrote a book on the Little Bang Theory. And what he said was since about the time of the flood, there was a planet destroyed at the asteroid belt, where the asteroid belt is. Uh, we should have a planet. According to Bode's law, we should have a planet where the asteroid belt is. And now all we have is this rock, is the asteroids, which is chunks of rock in that, in that orbit where that planet should be. And uh, as I said, I've known about this for, for 30 years, but I've kept my mouth shut until just recently. And now there's so much evidence that something happened at the time of the flood. A planet, a, it appears a planet was destroyed at the time of the flood. There was a planet where the asteroid belt is. Astronomers will talk about this. You can look up the late heavy bombardment of the inner solar system. And they, there's a thousand papers written on how the inner solar system is beat up from the asteroid belt. Late heavy bombardment. You can look that up, Google that. And so some of the evidence is... The fact that the Earth, every day of creation was very good. Asteroids hitting would not be good. Um, we could, uh, if we look at Mars, Mars being right next to the asteroid belt, Mars, the meteor impacts on Mars are in one hemisphere. 90% of the impacts on Mars are in one hemisphere. 90% of the impacts on Mars happen in four hours. We know the rotation speed of Mars and the impacts happen from the asteroid belt in four hours on Mars in one hemisphere. The back side of the moon is beat up. And uh, the side that we don't see because now we have debris coming in. This, if a planet was destroyed, if the Lord crashed something in there at the time of the flood, we have debris for the windows of heaven. The Bible tells us there was a water canopy over the earth. And it never rains. It never had rained prior to that time. They didn't have rain. And it needs dust particles to rain. It needs particles to form for the water droplets. Now, if we have this exploding planet, all this debris spread throughout the solar system, the inner solar system particularly, we have a source to cause the windows of heaven to open up and cause the flood. Um, I was reading an article that said the moon is all beat up on the backside. And uh, we see the same side of the moon all the time. The moon shows its same face to us all the time. And we don't see the backside. We couldn't believe when we, the Russians went up and took the first pictures of the backside of the moon. We couldn't believe how beat up it was. And so here's an article that says, well, obviously the windshield on your car gets all the rocks and the pits. So they said, obviously the moon, this used to be the front of the moon, the leading edge of the moon as it went around. But now it's shifted and we don't see that side. On the moon, when we have impacts on the moon, uh, it, they don't burn up. On Earth, we have the uh, vapor, the atmosphere burns up meter impacts. We have vegetation that covers them up. We have water erosion. We have wind erosion. Uh, many of them never even hit the ground. And so we don't see the impacts because of the atmosphere would put all of these things. Uh, we do know some big ones. We had a big one in Russia. We had a big one in, uh, well, there's one in Arizona, Bear, uh, Behringer Crater. There's one in uh, Crater Lake and, and Oregon, and so we know many of these big, there are big, big impacts out there. Uh, there's whole strings of these things <clears throat> out there. But uh, the reason the moon looks so much worse than the Earth because we do have an atmosphere, we have wind erosion, water erosion, and uh, vegetation grows up to cover up the impacts where the moon doesn't have that. Now, what the, some of the clinching evidence was that really started me talking about this 
Uh, there is a man by the name, a mathematician in Australia by the name of Dodwell, and he started looking at Stonehenge. <clears throat> and uh, Stonehenge, you know, is made around the solar system, made around the planets and so forth. And uh, there's another one in Egypt, uh, a, a monolith like this, and uh, it's called Amun-Ra. It's in Karnak. And on this one, the sun comes down, that's a third of a mile long. That corridor is a third of a mile long. On the longest day of the year, the sun comes down there for that one day, comes down that corridor. The Pharaoh would stand there and be identified as a sun god, okay? Well, the sun doesn't come down there anymore. And as Dodwell, this mathematician from Australia started, Australia started looking at Stonehenge and started looking at Amun-Ra, Karnak there, the temple, and he was a mathematician, and he started, and, and the sun didn't come down there anymore, and things aren't working. And uh, in fact, the uh, historians and the astronomers can't even agree on Stonehenge. The, I think the historians were saying it was made by the Druids 300 BC, and um, the astronomers are saying it was like 1000 BC because there's a conflict in the orbits there and so forth of the, the solar system and the planets. So Dodwell went to work mathematically and came to the conclusion something hit our earth at the time of the flood. He calculated, Dodwell calculated that there was an impact on the earth at 2348 BC. You can go on the internet, read about Dodwell. Uh, he said something hit the earth at 2348 and began the flood, shifted it on its axis. The earth is like a free-free gyro. A uh, gyro spins, but then when you bump it, it sets up another wobble. Over time, it tends to correct itself. And uh, it wasn't until I read about Dodwell and Archbishop Usher that I started talking about that. Now a Christian can explain. When you see that moon so beat up, evolution says, of course, it's been here for billions of years. That's what we expect. But when you read about the late heavy bombardment, now, of course, the late heavy bombardment, they would talk about, uh, you know, uh, millions of years ago, the inner solar system was beat up. But they admit the solar, inner solar system was beat up from the asteroid belt in the, in the late heavy bombardment. And uh, <clears throat> so Dodwell says something hit the Earth. He calculated mathematically that something hit the Earth at 2348 B.C. Archbishop Usher says the flood, he calculated the floods at 2345 B.C. And that was the clincher. That's when I started talking about this. I think there's something there, folks. Uh, when Archbishop Usher calculates the flood, and it's like three years different from a mathematician working backwards from Amun-Ra, the temple in, in Egypt, in Karnak. And uh, so to me, uh, we now have an explanation of how the moon got so beat up. And, uh, you know, when, when evolution says uh, they expect that because the Earth is, and the moon are billions of years old. Well, that is uh, part of that program. Uh, but, folks, when I, the more I get into astronomy, the more I get under the microscope, uh, the more I read and learn, I see an incredible God. The Bible says, what is man? What is man that thou art mindful of him? The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, are my ways above your ways? How high are the heavens above the earth? Well, the Hubble has shown us that. You know, the Hubble looked through a little tiny speck of the sky and saw 20,000 galaxies. And now we have a picture of what they say is the last galaxy, the farthest galaxy we have ever seen. And they believe that it's about 13.7 billion light years away, taking 13.7 billion years for that light to get here from that farthest galaxy. And I should probably say, and I've said this before in this series, I think the Earth is young and there are a hundred things about the Earth that show us it was young. Uh, we can look at the nickel in the ocean. We could look at the erosion. If the Earth was billions and billions of years old, they, we'd be eroded into the sea. Uh, we could look at the depletion of the magnetic field. We could look at the moon moving away. If you run that back millions of year, million years, couple million years, the earth is overcome by tides, and we would have 3,000-foot uh, tides 
at the rate the moon is now moving away. So there's much, much evidence that the, that the earth is, was formed. I think uh, that God placed life on it here in recent times. But getting back to that last galaxy, that farthest galaxy out there, 13 point, well, we cannot comprehend a billion. We can't comprehend a light year, that <laughs> light year, six trillion miles. Uh, we can't comprehend that. And yet the Bible in Psalm uh, 103, starting verse 10, is one of my favorite ones. The Bible says that God hasn't dealt with, he does not deal with us after our sin. Are you thankful? We're thankful for that, aren't we? We're all sinful people. We're all sinners in need of his grace. And so the Bible says God doesn't deal with us after our sin, nor reward us according to our iniquity for for as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's how great God's mercy is. Can you comprehend that 13.7? We can't comprehend that, can How great his mercy is and his love for us. What's the next verse say? As far as the east is from the west. Can you comprehend how far the east is from the west? <laughs> we can't comprehend that, can we? Psalm 103, starting with 10, 11, 12, says... That's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great his mercy is. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. And I know there are many Christians in America, that's all they want to hear, this unbelievable grace. They don't want to hear about following the Lord. I was in lecturing in Pinehurst, North Carolina in a Presbyterian church. And after a, pa a teacher came up to me and he said, we live in the Bible Belt. We're in the Bible Belt down here. He says, down here, everybody loves Jesus. Nobody knows what he said. <laughs> so we need to follow the Lord, but we need a balance. The Bible does say straight is the gate, narrow is the way. So once again, folks, thank you for watching Heavens Declare.